Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you for hosting me today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this work to you. Um, even though uh, Jermaine mentioned a, a lot of work that I've done in the past, what I'm gonna focus on today is really just giving everyone a snapshot of what's going on with adolescents today. Um, this current generation of adolescents, contrasting that with previous generations of adolescents, because there are remarkable time trends um, and very few uh, explanations for what's going on. So I, I challenge everyone in the room to come up with your best explanations and maybe, you know, in the discussion and over lunch, we can talk about studies that we might design to test different competing explanations for the trends that we observe. Um, so the first statement that I'm going to try to convince you of is that psychiatric disorders and suicidality, especially in adolescent girls, are increasing, um, particularly in the past decade. And this is actually su pretty surprising because for about 50 years of research, um, mood disorders, depression, anxiety, um, and other kinds of disorders that focus on rumination and disrupted mood were very stable among adolescents. And this was researched time and time again, especially in the 1990s, as treatment for mood disorders rapidly increased. We had uh, the rapid expansion of SSRIs and direct-to-consumer advertising that destigmatized depression, really brought many more kids into the clinic to be treated for mood disorders. And so treatment rates increased exponentially. And of course, that classic ep epidemiological question, well, even though treatment is increasing, is true prevalence increasing? Or is this just an artifact of ascertainment? And so there was a lot of research into that, um, especially in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And this is um, a meta-analysis that Jane Costello um, and her colleagues conducted where they looked at 26 different studies of 60,000 observations in children born 1965 to 1996. And essentially, there was no evidence for an increase in the of child or adolescent depression over the 30 years of research that they collected for this meta-analysis. You know, prevalence was stable. Treatment rates increasing, but prevalence stable. And so the case was kind of closed, and you saw that argument made again and again, that true prevalence is stable for mood disorders um, across a wide swath of time. But really since 2010, the picture has been changing. And I'm going to show you independent data sources which, with a bunch of different independently ascertained outcomes to try to convince you of this. So these are data from the National Household Survey of Drug Use and Health. So teens, adolescents that are surveyed in their household using structured interviews administered by lay interviewers that generate DSM-4 diagnoses of major depressive episodes. And we can see um, this is girls and boys, you know, prevalence starting in 2005 was relatively stable, you know, just some normal fluctuation. But we really see after about 2010, 2011, the prevalence of major depressive episodes starts to increase, especially among girls. Um, in my own research, using monitoring the future data, this is a yearly cross-sectional survey that we do of 45,000 8th, 10th, and 12th grade school attending adolescents in the United States. It's nationally representative and we've been doing it every single year since 1976. And the questions we have regarding mood um, and, and other types of mood related states have remained totally consistent in the survey since 1976, the same four questions asked every single year in the same part of the questionnaire. Um, and so these are, uh, you know, so eighth grade is here in the blue line, 10th grade is here in the green line, and 12th grade is here in the red line. These are boys and these are girls. And particularly focusing on girls, you can see that actually depressive affect, which is this four item scale, which are things like, um, I'm hopeless about the future, um, you know, I'm sad all the time, um, and questions like that, we can see that depressive active was actually going down through much of the 90s and the early 2000s. And that, that same point that we saw in the National Household Survey, completely different survey, completely different instrument, completely different uh, people who are administering the study. But at the same point in 2009-2010, for 8th, 10th, and 12th grade girls, um, through these are data are through 2016, and we've now analyzed these data through 2019, depressive affect starts going up rapidly. 
We also, in Monitoring the Future, these are data that we're working on right now, assess other domains of internalizing symptoms. So we assess, using multiple questions, how lonely adolescents are, how their self-esteem is, and a construct known as self-derogation, so how much you like yourself. Um, so questions in all of those domains, and we see the same exact phenomenon starting around 2010, 2011. Loneliness goes up, especially for girls. Self-esteem goes rapidly down and self-derogation starts to go rapidly up. And those same trends are consistent through 2019. So another national survey of adolescents is the youth the YRBS survey, the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Study. And unlike Monitoring the Future and the National Household Survey, um, the YRBS study directly asks about suicidal behavior. So suicidal, um, suicide attempts, uh, thinking about suicide, um, thinking about suicide to the extent that you have a plan for how you would kill yourself and also uh, attempting suicide in such a serious way that you had to seek medical attention. And remarkably, in the same exact year, 2010, and afterwards, suicide, suicidal behavior among U.S. adolescents starts to go up, especially for these more prevalent outcomes of thinking about suicide and having a plan for how you would kill yourself. Um, and these data are not disaggregated by sex, but if you look at it by sex, the increase is greater among girls. Okay, so you might say, well, this is just an artifact of reporting. Maybe adolescents are just more likely to report, um, you know, feeling sad, feeling blue, feeling suicidal. So I'm going to show you data now that are not based on self-report. Uh, these are data based on um, the HCUP uh, collection of data sets, and so these are um, visits to the uh, emergency department that were coded as um, suicide attempts or suicidal ideation um, based on the hospital record. And uh, so down here in, I guess that's blue, I don't know, the gray, grayish blue, is the trend for all pediatric ED visits. And there's no significant trend over time in just kids going to the emergency department. What there is a significant trend over time for is kids going to the emergency department and getting coded as a suicide attempt or a suicide ideation. And same exact as the self-report, it's 2010 when that changes. Completed suicide, uh, fatal suicide, uh, is, is, has also been documented to be exponentially increasing among adolescents. The uh, just one note, the axes here are different. On, on the left here is males, and on the right here is females. Um, males uh, complete suicide at much higher rates than females, and so just note that these axes are, this only goes up to six, this goes up to 20. But, you know, very much the same, it's this 2010 point, especially for girls, where fatal suicide also starts to increase. So, to summarize, we see increases in six different independent data sets in major depressive episodes, uh, loneliness, self-esteem, self-derogation, depressive affect, suicidal behavior, attempted suicide resulting in an injury, and completed suicide. All of them with this kind of critical access point around 2010, um, and all of them showing a greater increase among girls. Nobody knows why, but that doesn't stop us. We all hypothesize. Does, does anyone have a suggestion? What, what would you suggest? Yes. Right. So that's the, that's the number one thing that people have kind of speculated wildly about in the news. Um, Jean Twenge, for example, who's a developmental psychologist, published this really high profile article in Atlantic Monthly, have smartphones destroyed a generation. There was an open letter to Apple shareholders from um, a bunch of different investors calling for uh, restrictions on smartphone use. Uh, to teens because there was an increased risk of suicide for using a smartphone. And it's a compelling hypothesis, right? Like 2010, you know, that's when, you know, iPhones kind of started around 2007, but took a couple years to kind of get adopted and people started using smartphones. You look at a teen now and all they're doing is staring at their screen, can't be good for them. Uh, you know, this must be the culprit, right? And so there's been a ton of research into smartphones and mood. Um, and so this is just kind of an example of the type of research that you see. This is also Gene Twenge um, looking at the association between screen time and lower psychological well-being among children and adolescents. And what's been kind of described as a Goldilocks effect, um, using a little bit of screens, 
uh, you know, well-being starts to go up. In this study, this is just a, a continuous scale of um, general psychological distress, essentially. Um, and so, you know, you see the kind of an increase at really low levels, and then you start to see a decrease with the number of hours um, a day using a screen. And so in kind of cross-sectional studies, you, you generally see this same pattern. But it's actually much more complicated once you really get into the data. And I think this study provides a really good summary of the complexities of studying screen time, something like screen time and adolescent well-being. This is a paper published last year by Orban and Shabilsky, where they did this methodological um, approach known as specification curve analysis. And essentially what they said was, look, you can measure screen time in a couple different, you can measure it continuously, you can measure it dichotomously, you can measure it in an ordinal way. Same thing with well-being. You know, how are you going to actually construct your measure of well-being or psychological distress or mood symptoms, etc.? Then you have a, an array of different options for control variables, right? Obviously, there's going to be confounding of this relationship. And so, you know, there's all these different ways that you can categorize confounders. What if we did them all? So they did tens of thousands of regressions categorizing screen time, well-being, and confounders in, in every different, basically, configuration that they could. And then they took each of those betas from those many, many, many different regressions and graphed all of those betas. Uh, so this is through 40,000 different specifications of the functional form of the regression associating screen time, which includes like social media, technology, internet, TV, et cetera, and all these different variables for well-being. And this is just whether you had controls or not. But basically, if you graph all of these betas, essentially what's in red here is not significant, like not statistically significant at P less than 0.05. But depending on how I categorize screen time and how I categorize psychological distress or well-being, I can show you that there's a significant negative association. I can show you that there's a significant positive association. I can generate whatever conclusion I want based on how I categorize my exposure, my outcome, and my confounders. Um, but essentially, if you do all 40,000 of these regressions and you take the mean of all 40,000, you get an effect right there. Borderline kind of statistically significant negative association between use of screens and mental health. Um, but a tiny effect. In fact, what they then did in this paper, it's a great, I love this paper, obviously, like everyone should read this paper. It's just brilliantly done. Um, they looked at the YRBS, that same data I told you about, and the Monitoring the Future, the study that I work on, and then a UK uh, study called MCS. And they looked at how much bigger the effect is for known risk factors for your mental health compared to using a lot of screens. So binge drinking, for example, has three times worse effect on your mental health than using a lot of screens in YRBS, eight times worse in monitoring the future. And if you just go down the list, for example, in monitoring the future, using marijuana is 10 times worse than your, for your mental health than using a lot of screens. Getting into fights 15 times worse. And smoking cigarettes is almost 20 times worse for your mental health than using a lot of screens. They also looked at things that were better for your mental health than using a lot of screens. So for example, eating fruit is 10 times better for your mental health <laughs> than using a lot of screens. And the only factors that were similarly bad for your mental health than using a lot of screens were eating potatoes and drinking milk. <laughs> In our own work in monitoring the future, what we've really focused on is this issue of selection. So kids who spend a lot of time using screens and using social media might be more likely to have mood disorders because that's why they're inside, watching TV, using a screen, and not perhaps playing sports or engaging with adolescents in, in the IRL uh, situation. So we, tr we developed a propensity score. So we said, all right, we've got all this data in monitoring the future. We can, we can use a, basically a regression equation to, pr to predict each adolescent's propensity of having high depressive symptoms. And then look at the association between using social media and depressive symptoms within each of those categories. You have a high propensity for being depressed or you have a low propensity for being depressed. And so that's what we did here. Each of these different groups is your depression propensity. So these are people who have a low propensity to be depressed. These are people who have a high propensity to be depressed. So they have a lot of risk factors for depression. 
and we had this outcome of depressive affect, but because depressive affect doesn't have any real clinical meeting at a particular cutoff, we looked at a bunch of different cutoffs because we're epidemiologists and that's what we like to do. And essentially, when you look at it this way, so overall, if you don't stratify by depression propensity, among girls, you do see a linear association between the amount of social media that girls use and a decrease in their uh, mental health or an increase in the depressive affect. Uh, but when you stratify it by depression propensity, you essentially have no effect. And the only real signal, barely signal of an association is um, among girls who have a very low propensity to be depressed. And for boys, uh, we actually found that overall, that using a lot of social media was protective for adverse mental health problems. And when we stratified by depression pr propensity, there's really no kind of consistent effect, you know, a couple associations emerge, um, but there's really no clear pattern or clear story, which led us to conclude that there's really nothing going on here. Like in, in these nationally representative data that we have with all these different measures of mental health and mood and, um, and media use, it's exactly what Orban and Shabilsky found, you know, we can, we can kind of muster up a very low magnitude uh, adverse effect, um, but it doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. And just a couple weeks ago, um, last week, uh, Candace Odgers published the latest meta-analysis of social media and digital media use and mental health um, using meta-analyzing the different meta-analyses themselves and also doing narrative reviews um, and basically concluded that there's nothing there. Um, so the data has been correlational, focused on adults versus adolescents, a mix of conflicting small positive, small negative, and null associations. And essentially, when you really dig through the data, what you find is that associations between the amount of digital technology use and adolescents' well-being um, do not offer a way of distinguishing cause from effect and are unlikely to be of clinical or practical significance. And this was just covered in the New York Times uh, last week, now the tide is turning from this, like, our smartphones destroying a generation. Um, and I didn't put the date up here, but it was just this week, maybe a couple days ago. Um, panicked about your kids' phones? New research says don't. And it was a profile of Candace and that, um, and that meta-analysis. So, sitting where I'm sitting, trying to understand, well, what's driving these increases in adolescent mental health? You know, we really went down that, we really went down the digital media lane for quite a long time and haven't really been able to, to find any compelling evidence. And so now we're starting to look for other explanations. And this is where I'd love for everyone to uh, give me their favorite explanations. I'll show you a couple different things that we're working on now. One is that, you know, even though all adolescents are taking in information, they're staring at a screen, they're using digital technology, they're using social media, the type of information that they're getting is very heterogeneous, right? And so it, maybe it's not the actual act of staring at the screen, it's the type of information you're getting from that screen that might be deleterious to mental health, especially for girls. And I'll show you um, one graph that I found really striking. So another area of interest of ours has been in the effects of um, the, the mental health effects of different political climates, especially, you know, is there an effect, a uh, mental health effect after the 2016 election that was very divisive and, um, you know, and particularly for women, you know, there was like this, you know, hope that there was going to be this female president, didn't happen. Um, not sure if everyone's aware, but it didn't happen. <laughs> so we said, well, we can look at this and monitoring the future data. And now th this is through 2017, but we've looked at it through 2019 as well. And we separated our adolescents. We have a bunch of different questions about political affiliation and political engagement and political preferences. Um, and so one thing we started to look at was whether, um, whether adolescents, they can identify as uh, mostly Democrat, you know, Democrat, mostly Democrat, Republican, mostly Republican, unsure, don't know, you know, those types of questions. And so actually around 50% of, of adolescents in this survey, these are the 12th grade students said, unsure. But among those students who did have a political preference, we looked at the trends in depressive affect. And essentially what we found is that there's almost no downward trend in mental health for 
boys in 12th grade who identify as either Republican or mostly Republican. Uh, you see somewhat of a decrease in mental health for boys who identify as Democrat and for girls who identify as Republican, but the biggest downward trend and you know, significant interaction is for girls who identify as liberal or Democrat. And again, all these kids have smartphones. They're all looking at their smartphones. Only one group is having a decline in their mental health, and it's liberal-oriented girls. And so, you know, I would be curious what other people, what their take on this is. And, you know, this is, this is controlling for a whole bunch of different confounders, including a bunch of different demographics, region, religiosity, um, you know, all of those things that we put into our depression propensity score. And still we find this effect for liberal girls. And so one hypothesis is that it might be, you know, it's not the fact of being online, but it might be vitriol. It might be the type of information. It might be um, bullying that some girls can be exposed to when they're more politically active. Here's another hypothesis that we're uh, running down. I call this our breakfast club analysis because we took, I said, you know, in monitoring the future, we have thousands of variables on how adolescents are spending their time. So let's form latent profiles of adolescent time use and see if we can look at these trends in mental health, not by one particular way adolescents spend their time, like looking at a phone, but all the different ways that adolescents are spending their time. Um, and so this is just, um, We've, we went through a lot of different data reduction techniques, um, and essentially we, we came up with a four-group solution that represented adolescent time use in our survey. So different things adolescents are, are doing, spending their time, they could be spending their time damaging school property and skipping class, partying, dating, going out without a parent, going in cars for fun, which was like a thing we, like, thing we did in my high school. Um, stealing, going to movies, going to concerts, missing school. We used, a, a, we didn't have an indicator of how many hours a day you spend studying, so we used GPA as kind of a um, proxy for that. Being on social media, working for pay, listening to music, playing sports, being after school alone, uh, reading magazines. If, I don't know if adolescents still do that, but we query them about it. Community service, uh, doing homework, attending a religious service, watching TV. And essentially, um, when, when these all break out, you can, uh, a four group solution best represents these kids. Um, and the four, so for example, just to, to point out, social media, for example, these are the means across these four different groups, and they're very, very similar. So all the kids are on social media. But there are some things that are really, really different. So for example, damaging school property, group two has a much higher mean than any of the other groups. So group two is really characterized by doing kind of externalizing, under constrained um, behavior. Uh, group two, uh, group four is most likely to skip class, for example. Um, group one has really high GPA. Um, so basically you can break these out into the breakfast club groups. You know, you've got like the nerd, you've got a group that spends a lot of time doing sports and partying. So this is the Emilio Estevez group. Um, <laughs> Essentially, we've got group one, they, they don't spend very much time unsupervised. So these are kids who don't go out without their parents, they don't date, uh, they, don't go to, uh, they don't go to work, they don't work outside their home, they don't go to parties. You've got group two, adolescents who steal and damage school property. Group three spends more time unsupervised. These are jocks who party, essentially. Um, but they don't have the issues of group two and four. They're not damaging school property, and they're not group four who are the truants. They, these are kids who are skipping school a lot. And so we looked at their distributions across time. And groups um, four, the groups two and four have pretty low prevalence that is pretty steady over time. Kids who are damaging school property, kids who are um, truants. Uh, damaging school property is actually going down. I'll show you another slide about that later. Um, but, you know, those two groups are really stable. Most kids are in group one or group three. They're either spending less unsupervised time um, without their parents or they're spending more unsupervised time without their parents. That's about almost 90% of the sample is in one of those two groups. And you can see the group that increases in prevalence right around 2010 is the group that's spending less unsupervised time with their parents. So what's increasing in prevalence is n not spending time outside of your house, um, not going to parties, not working, not getting a driver's license, not dating. You know, these are groups that are just increasingly not engaged. And so rather than being a, a, a specific exposure like screen time or digital content, what we're seeing is that there's a, more, there's a much broader shift in how adolescents are engaging with the world 
and engaging with each other. Um, and it corresponds to these increases that we're seeing in poor adolescent mental health. So I don't really know, you know, and again, like these are just data that we're working on right now. We haven't really, we haven't submitted this for publication. These are preliminary. Um, so I would love reactions and comments that people have on the direction that this can go. Um, this is just an example that's indicative of that group, the group that's increasingly isolated. Uh, what we see in Monitoring the Future, and we published this a few years ago, uh, looking at these trends and conduct problems, these under-constrained behavior problems, is that across the board, kids are not going out of their house unsupervised at night. And, you know, you can, you can clearly see these decreases for both boys and girls that start, you know, really right around the late 2000s, the number, these are the mean evenings out per week without your parents. And so that's rapidly declining. Um, and in some ways that's a good news for public health, right? Because we're also seeing rapid declines in substance use, in vandalism, in, you know, all these different indicators of conduct problems. Um, but the implications for mood disorders, I think, remain uncertain. So switching gears now to that issue of substance use, that's kind of the other part of adolescence that I'd like to present to you. Because if we just stopped there and said, adolescents are getting more depressed, this is a big public health problem, you know, that would be one side of the coin. But I think it's also really important to talk about adolescent substance use, because there are some really interesting trends there as well that in some ways correspond to what we're seeing for mood disorders. So we would expect that if adolescent mental health is getting worse, that the risk factors for adolescent mental health should be getting more prevalent, right? Some of those historic risk factors, especially for adolescents, has been substance use. Kids who drink a lot of alcohol, uh, kids who use psychoactive substances are more likely to have mood disorders, are more likely to be depressed, are certainly more likely to be suicidal. Um, but actually what we're seeing in adolescent substance use is what we in Monitoring the Future have been calling the great decline. Um, and this predates the, de the decline in mental health, but substance use among American adolescents by and large, and I'll show you a couple exceptions to this, but has been declining for about 30 years. So this is daily use of alcohol in the past 30 days and monitoring the future. And again, we've done this study all the way back to 1976, asking the same exact questions in the same exact part of the survey. Daily use of alcohol, you know, and this, again, these axes are different. This one only goes up to 10, this one goes up to 60, so just keep that in mind. Daily use of alcohol has been declining really since the late 1970s. And similarly, past two week binge drinking. So how often in the past two weeks have you had five or more drinks in a single setting? That's our definition of binge drinking. That's been really rapidly declining since the 1990s. Um, it's declining for both boys and girls, but boys started out much higher. Their decline is much faster. You basically now see a complete convergence in the gender differences in alcohol-related behaviors. And in fact, for alcohol initiation, now girls are more likely to initiate alcohol in adolescents than boys, but very low prevalence overall, especially compared to what we saw in the late 1970s and 1980s. Point of interest is that the highest prevalence for past two week binge drinking among high school seniors in our Monitoring the Future history was 1981. And who was a high school senior in 1981? Brett Kavanaugh. Just saying. <laughs> it's the year with the highest binge drinking in Monitoring the Future history. We also see, so you might say, well, it could be just alcohol experimentation, you know, hardcore drinkers, people who are drinking, you know, daily drinking is one thing, but also frequent binge drinking, you know, that's the more problematic behavior and that's more associated with mood disorders. So we might be seeing that on, on increasing in the population. But in fact, for frequent binge drinking, and we define this as six or more times in a month. So you're at least binge drinking every week, probably twice a week. Um, I won't take you through the methods of age period cohort analysis, um, but just, pay attention to the slope of these lines, which is negative, which means that frequent binge drinking is also decreasing among increasingly younger cohorts of adolescents in the US. What's also fascinating about the great decline in drinking and the increase in mood disorders is that when you look at the correlation by year, they are completely being decoupled. And so what this analysis that we did uses time varying effect modeling. Essentially, we modeled the odds ratio between drinking and depressive affect every single year throughout monitoring the future 
history since 1976. Um, these are only data from 1991. And then we fit a regression spline through those associations. So we could look at their functional form in a, um, in a flexible way. And what we see in the 90s and the 2000s is a kind of the well-replicated association. Kids who drink, kids who binge drink, are more likely to be higher on depressive affect than kids who don't binge drink. But since the increase in mood disorders uh, and depressive affect among these kids, drinking is increasingly decoupled from uh, depression. And so it's not that you might expect there to be an overselection that as drinking goes down, it's kids who have a lot of mood problems who are engaging in the problematic behavior, but in fact, you see the opposite. They're just simply uncorrelated. Um, and so, you know, these associations have gone down dramatically since the early 2000s. Um, so one question you might have is, well, maybe if we understand why alcohol use is decreasing among adolescents or what fueled that decrease in alcohol use, maybe we could apply some of those same lessons to these other mental health and behavioral health outcomes. Um, and so there's a lot of different analyses that have evaluated the effective role of alcohol policy, especially for underage drinking. So throughout this time period, really when we started to see that decline in, bin in alcohol consumption among adolescents, states were passing minimum legal drinking age laws. Um, and the last state passed a minimum legal drinking age law of 21 by 1986. And that had a profound impact on adolescents' access to alcohol. Over that same time, there's been a lot of other progressive public health alcohol policy initiatives. Uh, for example, David Jernigan and colleagues have focused on youth exposure to alcohol advertising. You know, how often are they seeing Budweiser commercials? And how often are they seeing Smirnoff ads in magazines? And what kinds of ways are alcohol companies and the alcohol industry trying to get those youth eyes? on their products. Um, and through, through a number of different legislative efforts to limit alcohol advertising to teens, what we can see is that in 2001, this is the proportion of teens who are exposed to so-called non-compliant ads. And so these are ads that appear in youth, uh, in um, magazines and in other types of media where the youth composition of the readership is greater than 30%. And so in 2001, uh, you can see how many millions of teens saw that type of advertising in, in non-compliant advertising. And by 2011, um, there's almost, there's no uh, non-compliant ads. There's still some overexposing ads. So these are ads in media where the youth composition is between 15 to 30%. Um, there's still some exposure there, but really we're seeing an increase in, uh, in uh, exposure, youth, alcohol advertising that is geared towards adults. So we have legal changes, we have advertising changes, but also there's just a lot of changes in social norms around alcohol use. And that sometimes can be a cause or a consequence of these other broader legislative and policy shifts. Um, so using monitoring the future data, for example, we looked at the proportion of each birth cohort that disapproves of binge drinking, right? So we asked kids like, you know, kind of independent of your drinking, um, how, how much do you disapprove of an adult binge drinking on the weekends? How much do you disapprove of an adult drinking one or two drinks a night? Um, you know, different kinds of questions about their approval and disapproval. Um, and then we characterize the proportion of cohort, the cohort who disapproved. And so this regression line looks at the relationship between the proportion of your cohort that disapproves of alcohol use and each adolescence log odds of an additional occasion of drinking in the past 30 days, controlling for their own attitude, right? And we see this positive association. So the more the cohort disapproves of your drinking, the less likely you are to engage in drinking, even if you yourself approve. So even if you have a very permissive attitude towards drinking, you know, your parents drink or you have older siblings who drink and you're exposed to it and you see it and no one really disapproves of it, you're protected from engaging in additional occasions of alcohol use um, if your cohort has restrictive social norms. So uh, we've looked at all that for alcohol and the story is really good. It's a pretty big public health success in terms of alcohol. Um, but this trend, this downward trend in alcohol use is part of a broader shift 
Um, and this is what I alluded to earlier about adolescent time use and problem behavior more generally. There's just been an overall decline in not only alcohol use and lauded by these specific public health initiatives, but a broader set of problem behaviors. So if you look at past month cigarette use, for example, you know, there's been a great decline in past month cigarette use after the height in the, 19, the late 1990s. Cigarette use among both boys and girls has been declining every single year and still does. Uh, conduct problems. So this is defacing public property, um, stealing things. Uh, we ask about stealing things worth more than fifty dollars, stealing things worth less than fifty dollars. You know, vandalism, truancy. You know, these different types of externalizing behaviors. Uh, the red line here is what we observe and monitor in the future. Boys have been declining in terms of conduct problems uh, since 1991. Graphed on a secondary axis here is a black line that is arrest rates. Um, just again, to use two different data sources to try to adjudicate potential issues of self-report. Um, so not only are self-reported conduct problems declining, but arrest rates are remarkably declining at a, at a parallel rate. Um, again, graphed on a secondary axis because getting arrested for a crime is, actually, is obviously much more rare than committing a crime. And for girls, there's somewhat of a decline as well. They're starting out smaller, uh, but certainly less of a decline in the slope compared to the boys. Um, the two exceptions, I think probably in everyone's mind as I'm talking about declines in substance use, there's really two exceptions to it, cannabis and vaping. And so I'm just going to show you some of the trends in both of those. So this is uh, past month cannabis use among boys and girls uh, a, in the 12th grade in the United States since the mid 1970s, you know, in the late 1970s, big pot era. Um, and then there was like a decline during the just say no 80s and then during the 90s, you know, marijuana use went up a lot more. But really since then, you know, there was a little bit of a dip right here um, and then an increase in the late 2000s. But cannabis use certainly um, among both boys and girls uh, certainly has not been decreasing at the same rate that we've seen for these other substances, alcohol and tobacco most especially, you know, those substances had really clear negative slopes. Cannabis use, you know, it's kind of, it's a little more up and down. You know, if you look from 97 to, to 2017, there's really no change um, for boys and, and even more stable among girls. So question, does anyone have any ideas why even though all of these other substances are declining, cannabis use hasn't declined? Okay. So, oh, this is also to say that frequent marijuana use is also increasing. So it's not just experimenting, um, frequent marijuana uses as well. I'll get back to vaping. So we've spent a lot of time in monitoring the future and in a bunch of other studies trying to document the effects of medical, state specific effects of medical marijuana laws on cannabis use among youth, because that was like the big concern, right? We're going to Marijuana is going to be more available in these states because adults are using med medicinally. Everyone's going to have it in their home. It's going to be in their medicine cabinet. It's going to be more available. It's going to affect the illegal markets. And so this is 11 different studies of medical marijuana law passage and state-specific effects on marijuana use. And we have looked at medical marijuana laws every way that you can. Do they have dispensary allowances or not? Is there home cultivation or not? How, like, how is the medical marijuana adjudicated? Do you need a specific card? What conditions are approved for medical marijuana use? And that's different in every single state. And basically, no matter how you slice and dice and, and look at different subgroups in the data, this is a meta-analysis that we published about uh, almost two years ago now, um, which basically showed there's absolutely no effect. There's, there's no effect of medical marijuana laws on adolescent marijuana use. And now, of course, we've been following up these studies and looking at you know, so-called recreational or adult-only uh, cannabis laws that are now increasingly passed in the U.S. states. Um, and, you know, it really depends on the state in terms of the trends that we're seeing, but there's not a huge uptick in adolescent cannabis use. Um, so it's something else. Now, these are all state-specific effects. These are not going to pick up, these are all difference in difference models, state-specific changes in marijuana use. They won't pick up 
broader environmental changes. So if adolescents, if, if just there's a general trend toward adolescents seeing cannabis as less risky, seeing cannabis as medicinal, um, you know, changes in just overall access to and popularity of cannabis, they would not be captured in these state specific effects. But certainly living in a state that passes a medical marijuana law is not associated with adolescent cannabis use. Um, going back to vaping, you know, that is relatively new on the horizon for us in monitoring the future. We started measuring e-cigarette use in 2015. Um, there's one survey, the National Youth Tobacco Survey, that started measuring vaping uh, a few years earlier than that. Um, but so really we're just starting to understand the trends in adolescent vaping. So this is the prevalence um, in 2017, 2018, and 2019. Uh, for example, um, vaping, nicotine vaping in the past 30 days for 12th graders, it's, it's more than doubled in just those three years. And in fact, um, the, and, and this was just published about two weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, in which we reaffirmed that the change in vaping prevalence among high school attending adolescents is the largest one-year change in any substance that we have observed in monitoring the future for any one year change since 1976. So no substance in the history of monitoring the future has increased that much in a one year period. And the increases have continued into 2019. Um, so certainly vaping is something that is on the radar of monitoring the future. Um, and, you know, I think there remain a lot of questions about what the implications of that are for adolescent health. Okay, so if it's not, going back to kind of the cannabis question, if cannabis is not changing because of, um, because of marijuana laws, then what is it? Well, Richard Miak, who is the PI of Monitoring the Future, had this really clever hypothesis that he looked at, and now we've looked at in a number of different papers, which is the enduring influence of the decline in cigarette smoking. Now we know from Denise Kandel and a whole bunch of other people uh, that cigarette smoking increases the risk of later transition to other drugs. And it's uh, hyperbolically called the gateway hypothesis, and we can have discussions about um, the way people misappropriate that term. But putting those discussions aside, I think we can all agree that using one substance increases the risk of using other substances, right? Um, and so cigarette use historically was a strong risk factor for trying marijuana use. Most kids who tried marijuana had first smoked a cigarette. And as, can, as cigarette use has declined, um, the question becomes, what is the implication of that for cannabis use? So what Richard did in this paper with colleagues is he looked at the trends in past year marijuana use stratified by ever having smoked a cigarette, ever having had a drink, uh, and, 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 and never smoking, never having a drink or smoking. And essentially among all three groups, the cannabis use prevalence is actually increasing. So when you look among kids who've never smoked a cigarette, cannabis use is going up. When you look among kids who've ever smoked a cigarette, cannabis use is also going up because so many more kids have transitioned from a high risk group to a low risk group over time, it makes the prevalence seem flat. But if you had stratified by these different groups, the prevalence would have gone up. Now the implication of that depends on how you think about the causal structure of cigarette use and cannabis use. Our interpretation is that the flat rate that you see for cannabis use is the true rate. It's just that it would have gone up had we not prevented all those kids from smoking. But because we did prevent all those kids from smoking, this mechanism of smoking leading to increased risk of cannabis use could not be activated for an increasingly large proportion of adolescents. We have shown the same thing now, not only for, um, not only for cannabis use, but a bunch of other drugs, including opioids, which is the narcotic category here. So what you see here in blue is the projected prevalence of tranquilizer use, amphetamine use, and opioid use if cigarette smoking had remained at the levels that it was in 2000. And then the red line is what we actually observe. So for example, for opioids, we, what we actually observed was this decline in opioid use starting around 2008, 2009 that decline would have been halved, if not more, if we had not prevented kids from smoking. So smoking remains one of the key kind of public health measures that we can use to prevent 
if, if you agree with the causal structure, then continuing to push the lever on smoking is going to have numerous downstream consequences, not only for adolescent health, not only for adolescent respiratory health and cardiovascular health and all the things we know that smoking does to damage your body, but it has huge social implications for uh, the decline in other substances in the U.S. So with my remaining time here, I want to just not only talk about adolescents because sometimes they grow up and they become adults. Um, so just a, a few kind of ending notes on what's going on with adults. For mental health, um, these are data from um, the MIDAS study where they looked at um, depression uh, across these different axes, negative affect, positive affect, life satisfaction. And essentially the, the, the purple group here are, um, are people who are in the 90th percentile or above of SES. Rich people's mental health is fine. Um, it's going great. It's getting better. <laughs> the people who are having a decline in mental health in the US in the lowest rung of the socioeconomic status ladder, increasing health disparities in the US. For completed suicide, uh, you know, I showed you the trends for adolescents, but for adults, completed suicide is at crisis levels. Uh, nationally, suicide among adults has increased more than 30% in just 10 years. And again, these axes, just pay attention because the axes for boys and men are, is much higher than for girls and women because of a much higher completed suicide rate. But the group with the highest absolute increase in suicide are men in midlife, age 45 to 64. Um, and that group among those with low education are the group that has had the biggest decrease in mental health and the biggest increase in opioid overdose. During that same time, alcohol consumption, even though it's, we've got the great decline going on in adolescence, for adults, alcohol consumption per capita alcohol sales have been increasing since the early 2000s. We had like the height of the Mad Men era over here, like the late 70s. Um, then there was a, a really rapid decline in per capita ethanol consumption, but it's really been increasing since the 2000s. And there's only one group that alcohol consumption has been increasing among, and it is women in midlife. So this is a meta-analysis that came out a couple years ago, looking at the past year prevalence of binge drinking by among adult men and women. And you can see overall binge drinking is increasing for men who drink more than women, the increase is completely flat. There's no change over time. And for women, um, there has been a consistent increase in binge drinking. And if you look across all different axes of alcohol consumption, it is increasing among women aged 30 to 45. So we've been looking at this in my research group across a number of different domains. And the first thing that everyone says when we talk about this is mommy drinking right? That there's been a change in social norms and now it's okay to drink mimosas on your play date and people are pouring wine at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and so it's mommy drinking and this is the problem. We've got to stop those mothers from drinking. And so we looked in the National Household Survey at the prevalence of binge drinking among men and women who have, who are parenting children uh, or who have, I should say, who have individuals less than 18 living in their home um, and those who don't. And you can see here, uh, this is women with children, women without children. Women without children binge drink more than women with children, and they're both increasing in this midlife area. For men, again, decreasing. Men are decreasing at age 18 to 29, 30, 44, and even 45 to 55. Women in this group, uh, especially women without children, are increasing their binge drinking. So it's not mommy drinking. What it is, is concentrated along women with very high SES in education. So some of the people in this room, perhaps, who have high levels of education uh, are at the most risk for binge drinking, especially women in my age group, 30 to 45. Um, this is work that I'm pursuing with a doctoral student, but essentially each of these lines is the trend in binge drinking for women in midlife in a particular educational group. Women with the lowest education have no increase in binge drinking. Women with the highest education, that's, oops, that's this group right here, have the fastest increases in binge drinking. In fact, the group with the highest slope for binge drinking are women age 30, 45 with a doctoral degree.
<laughs> so would love people's thoughts on why that is, maybe over drinks later, just kidding. Um, and so the last piece of data that I'll leave you with and then have some, at least a few minutes for discussion is that these trends, right? Adult women drinking, adolescents declining drinking, adolescent mental health, adult mental health, they're not disconnected. These are the same people moving through historical time. And actually, if you follow them as birth cohorts, you start to uncover some really critical patterns. And just like Jermaine said, really understanding health through the life course requires you to follow different birth cohorts. And so that's what we're doing now in Mantra in the future. We follow each group of 18 year olds longitudinally. Um, and we have been since 1976. So we're now doing age 60 follow-ups of kids that we have information on their substance use with from age 18. And essentially what we did in this paper is we graphed, we did growth curve analysis where we graphed the intercept, so how much kids are binge drinking in age 18, and then we graphed the slope over time. What's the increase in binge drinking from age 18 through age 26 during that transition to adulthood? And essentially, without getting into a lot of details about the modeling, at age 18, this is just for males, and you can see the same thing for females, age 18 binge drinking is going down, right? Just like we said. Um, you know, so these are birth cohorts that were, you know, here's Brett Kavanaugh's cohort, 1981. Uh, so he, that's 12th grade, and so binge drinking levels going down across time. But this is the slope from age 18 to age 26. It's going up across time. So it's like a teeter-totter. The more the drinking declines at age 18, the faster the acceleration of drinking from age 18 to age 26, such that now when you look at age 30, not only is there no decline in the same birth cohorts that decline their drinking at age 18, but there's now even acceleration rapidly beyond age 30 in binge drinking. Um, so certainly, you know, making sense of what that means is complicated. I think one obvious take home message is that prevention doesn't end at age 18, right? Young adults, um, people who are in that transition to adulthood, which is increasingly getting extended, also require targeted preventive medicine, um, certainly around alcohol. And so uh, that's what my research group and I are pursuing over the next year. Um, so just some points of conclusion, adolescent mental health is rapidly declining. The causes unknown, but they're very unlikely to be a single exposure that has had a prevalence change, such as screen time. At the same time, adolescent substance use is generally lower than it's ever been, and it's increasingly disconnected from mental health. There are new potential threats on the horizon, specifically nicotine and cannabis vaping. Among adults, both mental health and substance use appear to be increasing, with a central focus, at least for alcohol use, among women in midlife. And that these connections between the adolescent patterns and the adult patterns are inadequately understood, but maybe an important area for us to focus on. So with that, I want to thank my funders, which have primarily been the NIH, and I would love to take questions for a few minutes, and if other people have thoughts, you know, feel free to find me. Thank you. You said you want a hypothesis, so I have a hypothesis for the 30 to 45 year old okay. male increase in drinking. Sex in the city. Those cosmopolitans that those women were always having, at least for the upper age amount, maybe it was that. It's <laughs> true. I mean, I was I remember being in college and watching that show and thinking that those were like that was the dream, right? That I would, and then I moved to New York. I mean, like it wasn't Sex in the City, believe me. But like that was, you know, but, but I think what it raises, actually there's been some really interesting media content analysis of the depictions of alcohol on screen. And for women especially, there has been a huge increase in depictions of women drunk, women drinking, um, the, the kind of um, alcohol not being uh, conceptualized as a harmful behavior, um, you know, bad moms, you know, you have all these increasing media sources that are depicting alcohol on screen for young women as something pleasurable, fun, and not harmful. Questions, Laura, what about women in the workplace in the correlation of people yeah. in households now to people working full time? Yes, so we're actually working on that right now in, in the National Household Survey. Um, and preliminarily, and we're not done with the analysis, but um, all of the increase in midlife women drinking are concentrated among employed women in high prestige positions. Prestige being, that's 
there's a lot of different opinions about how to define that. We're using the definition of workplace prestige that the general social survey uses, but uh, essentially it's women in very high socioeconomic status, high demanding jobs. Um, the occupation with the biggest increase is lawyers. Yes, so the one thing I can speak to, we don't have, at least in monitoring the future and in, in a lot of these other studies, um, we don't ask the parents how much they monitor their kids, but we do ask the kids how much do your parents monitor you. Um, and that's also gone up. Actually, I, I wasn't involved in this study, but someone in Monitoring the Future told me that basically for like the last eight years, like the mean of parental monitoring goes from like one to five and it's five. Like there's like, and there's no variation. He's like, we can't even analyze the data because like everyone reports that they're being constantly monitored. <laughs> We should. I mean, we haven't at all, especially in the adult women, but we have all that information and we certainly could look at it. Um, but we haven't, we just haven't had some time. <laughs> but thank you. Looking at the, the particular phenomenon of adolescence need to change, is this an American thing? Well, do you see this in other countries? Um, the, I don't, the mood disorder data, I'm not so sure about. Um, but for substance use, it has gone down among adolescents in a lot of European countries. Um, and that is the data that I know most readily. Um, we've also, I have some collaborators in Latin America where we've looked at prevalence of cannabis use and um, alcohol use. And I believe they generally pattern the North American trends as well. Certainly in Australia, that's the other country that I work with quite a bit. And they have had a similar uh, decline in substance use. Between Australia and Canada, that would be two good populations yeah. to see if they're experiencing. Same thing with their Yeah, for sure Australia, I mean certainly Australians drink more than Americans in general, but they have had similar declines. It's, it's, it's hard because Australia also has different, um, ice is much more of a commonly used illicit substance, um, which is like a methamphetamine based drug, and that's much more of a problem in Australia compared to the US. I'm not sure about Canadian data. I should know that, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but that's a really good question. I mean, we've looked at that in terms of sleep. We've done all these trends in sleep among US adolescents and sleep is rapidly declining and it very much corresponds to trends in pediatric obesity. Um, you know, because people thought that was a big screen time thing too. Like, you know, kids are on the screens all the time and now they're not gonna be able to sleep. And so we looked at that and sleep is declining, but it doesn't correspond to trends in screen time and only corresponds to trends in pediatric obesity. I'm just gonna ask you about um, sexual practices. Because we've seen, seen pregnancy rates go down drastically, but we're seeing sexual transmitted infections at their highest rate. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I was just curious. That's the elderly. <laughs> I mean, certainly, yeah, we, the monitoring the future, and there's a couple of other studies that ask about sexual initiation, you know, have you had sex for the first time, um, and also just dating and having sex, and, and across adolescents, it's declining. Adolescents are, their, their sexual debut is, is later, and they're less likely to date at all. I'm just also, I'm sorry, I'm curious about sexual orientation young women who, especially bisexual women, um, are most likely to use different substances. Yeah, so we are looking at that in the YRBS data. The, um, the Monitoring the Future study doesn't ask about sexual orientation, unfortunately. Um, so we don't know about the long-term trends, but certainly in YRBS we see the same, you know, there's certainly a sexual orientation disparity, um, and the declines have not been as rapid among those groups. 
crossroads, please. If you look at family composition or who lives in the home, because that's changed dramatically over time. And is that impacting on the, the female adolescent depressive symptoms? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked at that at all. Because it's changed. Yeah. No, I haven't looked at it. I mean, one hypothesis that we've been thinking about is the biggest impact on an adolescent's decision to use substances is usually an older sibling. Um, if you have an older sibling who smokes weed or drinks, you're much more likely to get access to it and think it's cool. Um, and because family size has been changing across this time, you're less likely to have an older sibling. And so I've been thinking about it in terms of sib shift, um, but not other types of family compositions. And so how about the impact of a helicopter parent? I mean, yeah, that, that's the parental monitoring piece, which uh, we haven't we haven't looked into it that much. But parental monitoring is definitely at an all time high. So we have time for one more question, but you're all welcome to come to lunch and feel yes. free to, uh, to ask any questions that you might have. So I think Anna's had her hand up the longest, and, and so I'm going to let her go. <laughs> um, okay, so the, it was a really interesting talk, um, and the things that kind of popped into my head, and maybe you've already looked at this. Um, is the opioid epidemic, which I feel like at least was peaking around that time. I don't think it explains the depressive disorder among girls, but girls are less likely to die by suicide using a firearm compared to boys. And if tons of opioids are available, maybe that could explain the increased PT visits. I don't know if that bears out. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, th I do think the, the consequences of the opioid epidemic for families um, has not been systematically investigated in terms of the rapid decline in adolescent mental health. You know, when you have tens of thousands of people, parents a year who are dying of overdose, that's going to have collateral damage, not only for kids, but extended, extended family networks. Um, so I, I have been more interested in looking at the overdose epidemic through that lens of kind of the consequences for overdose. In terms of pediatric exposure to opioids, um, certainly there has been an increase in ED visits for accidental pediatric exposure to opioids. But when you look at, I mean, the, the non-fatal data, I haven't seen good data on what people are presenting with in terms of the method that they use to attempt. For completed suicide, there hasn't been, I mean, opioids are most often not recorded as an intentional death. Um, they're much more likely to be recorded as unintentional, especially if someone was a known drug user. And so the proportion of those unintentional overdoses that are actually intentional, we don't know. But certainly for deaths that are recorded as an intentional using an opioid, that hasn't changed much over time. So we have three take-home messages. I think these are the ones that I heard. Number one, uh, don't holler at your kids. It seems like it's going to be okay. Uh, number two, um, we're looking to the men to look out for what's happening with uh, women in alcohol. Maybe there are lessons learned. Yeah. The, the success that we've had with men. I forgot the third one now. But <laughs> anybody have a third one? We, kept, we did the kids. Let your kids park alone. <laughs> let your kids what? Go to the park alone. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, and the other thing I'll say just as a closing message is that at one point that is, is often made and missed in these discussions is that a lot of the evidence from telemedicine and from delivery services for uh, therapy indicates that the modality that adolescents and adults want, uh, the increase in the modality that, that adolescents and adults want is delivery through a smartphone. And the available meta-analyses suggest that a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy is just as effective when delivered through a smartphone than it is via person-to-person -person, um, therapy delivery. So taking your adolescent smartphone away, which has been very much uh, on the minds of, of a lot of stakeholders, uh, might actually be taking away the one treatment delivery service for mood disorders that adolescents would actually prefer. Thank you very much. Thank you.